Hello, and here we are in part two for the divorce experience. And what we're going to be focusing on for the most part here is just looking at the developmental stages of divorce. So when you decide, okay, we're going to have to get a divorce here, what is the process typically? And then we're going to also look at the three crises of divorces. So just because you get a divorce doesn't mean everything's okay, even if it's the right reason for a divorce. And so usually there are some crisis stages, uh, both for men and women. And then the th third part we'll talk about will be what effect does divorce have on children and the effect of divorce doesn't affect I mean you have to imagine not everyone divorces when children are young sometimes it's when they're in their teens and sometimes when they're older and the effect isn't always the same and then we'll look also at issues around custody and how does that get determined and what are the conditions of custody in today and we'll touch a little bit on future issues as well all right so let's get on with Part two of the divorce experience. The road to divorce. You could call this the stages of divorce, but there's a process typically. And you're seeing three steps. The decision to divorce is first, you need to know that you want a divorce and that you've talked about it and you've decided. Ultimately, and in the best case scenario, you plan to break up. You don't just take off and never see each other again. There needs to be some sort of organized plan to make this legal statement of divorce and have it done legally so that if you do want to marry in the future or the conditions for your children and any kind of compensation one way or another that that can be dealt with in a legal manner so there's a plan and then thirdly and this is sometimes not as straightforward and easy as it may appear there's this, there's the separation and the family reorganization that is how are we now going to interact as a family because if we have children and we've gone through a divorce, we've broken up, we've separated, you're still a mom and a dad and you still have kids to parent. That doesn't mean there won't be other people involved, but you're not, not a parent. So divorce, a decision to divorce, the first stage, doesn't usually occur in a single phase. People may delay separation until a time when they consider it suitable. We'll wait till the kids are of this age or we'll wait until past Christmas um, usually, for example, women will uh, find a job or go back to school and couples wait until children leave home. Uh, back in my era, it wasn't uncommon to wait until kids and your, your kids grew up and moved out of the house. Then it felt like your responsibility for managing and looking after kids' lives were reduced and made possible a divorce as possible. Uh, some minority groups emphasize uh, family ties and responsibility above personal satisfaction. Now that decision to divorce, like I said, can happen in phases. And so oftentimes in, for lack of a better word, healthy couples, um, this is a decision that both of them make and it can go on a continuum right to where we know that people are in very difficult marriages very challenging ones and the decision of divorce might be the decision of one person not the other in which case it really makes the next step very important couples need to plan the breakup of the family system they need to work cooperatively to settle issues such as custody of children visitation uh, finances uh, the legal right and responsibility to care for a child um, when one's on their own what is it that's involved with that the planning process often uh, does not run very smoothly. This planning can be a difficult process. It challenges couples in the way that they communicate and solve problems in an already maybe difficult dynamic and difficult communication styles. And many couples separate and then reconcile repeatedly. They plan to break up, they sort of back off of that and stay together, and then they plan to break up again, and then they may come back together. Now certainly with families and again, I'll use the term healthy, and that's not maybe the most ideal word to use when you're talking about divorce, but there can be good divorces, and there can be people who know that this isn't working out, and then for the best interest of themselves and their futures and the relationship they want to maintain and their children, they plan in a manner that's as good as can be under those kinds of circumstances. And then, of course, there's other couples where if it's one person who's in a very difficult relationship, a woman, for example, and she wants to get out and she plans for the divorce, she needs to make sure she has a place to move to, that her kids are going to be safe, that there's money, 
that there's some manner in which to be protected and safe and that could take some time so these the plan for breakup could be something that takes more time than some people are prepared to take and then the third stage separation and family reorganization well separation changes the relationship between husband and wives Couples with children need to decide how to coordinate the responsibility as co-parents. If they're going to be co-parenting, not all separations are planned in that manner. Uh, but it's healthier if both parents can remain involved, particularly if both parents can remain involved and not, um, not sort of talk badly about the other parent to the children when that other parent isn't around. It's important that the parents remember that the children didn't cause the divorce. It's, the, it's an issue between parents. Um, many feel joint custody is best for children, and this is sort of a co-parenting role, if you will. One will have custody, but the joint custody will be a shared responsibility. When both parents are involved, children act as links, if you will, between the two connected households. They become the binuclear family, it's called. A binuclear family is when, in this case, you've got children who bounce from one home to another home, whether it's mom and the family children, and dad and his own, his own self bouncing back and forth. That makes it binuclear. But if mom and or dad both get remarried and have children, then that ch the children who bounce back and forth still make that a binuclear family. Now, crisis for of divorce and this is very typical for both men and women. They may experience these crises different, but they experience these crises nonetheless. Divorce produces what is called transitional states. Temporary imbalance to routines, to roles. I mean, when you go through a divorce, mom or dad, you're no longer a couple. So now mom is mom and dad while they're at home. Dad is dad. When he sees them, he's parenting, and when he doesn't see them, then it, it varies from certainly from father to father, but then that, ro that role of father starts to alter. And the routines, and how, you know, how we have dinner, and how we go to bed at night, and uh, how we celebrate um, uh, holidays, these routines all change. So the three crises, emotional, economic, and parenting. The emotional crisis, during and after the separation process, individuals suffer the loss of an important relationship. Whether you're happy or unhappy, going through the divorce changes things. Even if it was a bad relationship, change is sometimes difficult for people to adjust to. And so there's an emotional um, experience associated with that. Oftentimes you could, you could sort of look at it in a sort of way as a process, as, as um, of uh, someone dying. Uh, there's a uh, grieving process, and that's an emotional crisis. Often uh, um, has served, an, um, the relationship often serves as a center of their lives, and whether it's been satisfactory or not, that relationship was the center of one's life. Separation and divorce usually means the individuals have to redefine themselves as people. You know, I was a single, then I was a couple, we became a we, and now I'm a single and we're not a we. And that sort of shift is an emotional adjustment that needs to be made. With the growing number of divorced people, new social scripts are being developed. Relationships with extended family members change. Many have limited supports uh, from their own relatives with strong religious beliefs. You know, now, you know, the religious component of different families that are involved in the relationship can come into play, you know, that you're not supposed to divorce. This is not something that works well with us. And so those other issues become important and, and trying emotionally. They may, um, may long for a connection to the ex-spouse uh, or relatives who are no longer legally related. And I've seen this example before where families, because they've broken up, um, the, the partner that is no longer in the household often feels a loss of that, their former partner's family, the, which they may have had a good relationship with. Um, they must adapt, and it's about a two-year ad adaptation uh, post-divorce. 
most adapt about two years after. So when you think of examples where people have gone through a separation and divorce and then find themselves in a new relationship shortly after that, they haven't experienced the emotional crisis thoroughly enough and allowed it to have chance to sort of subside and then resolve it before starting a new relationship, in which case you're bringing in a whole lot of emotional experiences that this new person isn't the, isn't the, desire, isn't the design recipient of. Um, within six years, most have built a reasonably satisfying life, whether that is with somebody or on their own. You can look at the table in your text, uh, table 10.3, and look at the patterns of adjustment to divorce. Now, the economic crisis, uh, this is, <laughs> divorce is very expensive, and um, it usually means a drop in a standard of living, especially for the custodial parent. Both parents are, reason, are, are responsible for the support of the child, or children. If the non-custodial parent, which is usually the father, doesn't have a steady job or, is dis or has disappeared, the family may be reduced to living on welfare. And so this one, the experience, is usually more difficult on women economically. And so women tend to have a double whammy in particular because of the emotional crisis. It's, and again, it's not to say that you know, women are emotional. It's to say that you're breaking up a, a relationship uh, that once was at some point good and now it's not so good, so bad, in fact, that you want a divorce. And then the economic cri uh, crisis of, if you, unless you have your own work, even if you do, you're now paying for child care or arranging for child care, um, paying for all the household uh, expenses yourself. It becomes a very expensive ordeal. Not to say that that's a reason not to divorce. It's something to prepare for. And then thirdly is parenting. When a family separates, new boundaries must be drawn. Old family rules and rituals no longer exist and new ones have not yet taken their place. Each parent needs to establish a relationship with the children separate from each other. If there's no clear understanding of the new rules of the relationship, children are likely to become victims of conflict between parents. Divorcing parents may be unable to respond to their children's emotional needs. Now, if you look on in your textbook, I think it's around 227, page 227, uh, there's an effect that's called the sleeper effect. And you can check that out to see what is meant by the sleeper effect as it affects children. Now, you're seeing um, stressors and protective factors um, uh, for the child during divorce. And you're seeing a, co a collection. Divorce transfo transforms children's lives forever. It affects where they live, how they interact with their parents, if and how they continue relationships with their friends. Few children want their parents to divorce, no matter how much tension there is in the marriage. Children from divorced families are at greater risk of developing problems than children from stable two-parent families. And oftentimes it has a lot to do with the type of arguing, not whether or not parents argue. Is how fair do they argue? You know, do arguments end and end in a managed way where there's a solution? However, most do not, as um, the age of the child plays a very important role in how they manage a divorce. Very young children are less likely to be affected long-term by divorce if they receive good parenting. Divorce may affect boys and girls differently, and that kind of makes sense. Levels or level of parental conflict Pre-separation and post-separation impacts the adjustment more than the absence of a parent. So pay attention to that. The level of parental conflict, that if parents conflict and argue regularly before the separation and after the separation, that has more impact than whether or not a parent leaves the house and moves out. So it's what they witness. If they witness the arguing and a lot of it and a lot of negative experience, then it's, that's worse than, when a, than if a parent needs to leave and then they have a separation and divorce. The number and degree of life changes, I, you know, access to extended family members, the nature of new parenting relationships, there's many issues um, that affect uh, the child going through a, a divorce. And a reminder that it's not the child who causes the divorce. 
Now, custody and parenting, about who gets custody, well, the current standard used is, is, is what's in the best interest of the child. Now, there, there have been different standards in the past, and there will be different standards likely in the future. Currently, it's what's in the best interest of the child. If you sit in a family court and listen to the judge, the judge should be, and usually are, interested in not who's right and who's wrong, but what, are the, what, what is in the best interest of the child, and that's where the focus needs to be. Mothers are usually still granted custody, although more fathers have been gaining custody, and joint custody has been more common in, in separation and divorces. Children can, and do, unfortunately, become pawns in the angry fighting between parents still. So if we carry on with custody, there's two, problem, two major problems that arise out of custody conflicts. One is failure to comply with support orders, whether that's um, the mom or the father failing to comply with what the court says they need to be doing in support of the children, and with the custody provisions, the uh, amount of money that goes or the kind of conditions by which the uh, divorce has been granted for. The provinces are responsible for enforcing child support orders. Some parents try to prevent visits if support is not paid. You're not allowed to do that. Occasionally, a non-custodial parent takes the law into his or her own hand and kidnaps the child. Provinces are, are responsible for enforcing child support orders. So if, for example, um, the order that you have for in your separation and divorce um, um, if one or the other parent breaks or breaches that agreement, then it's the, usually you go to the province to get that support. And in many communities, they have a, a community and social services office of which part of that office is responsible for this sort of support. When we're considering on with um, custody and parenting and we see parents without the custody, this is um, most non-custodial parents are men. When the marriage is broken, men are sometimes at a loss as to how to manage the father-child relationship on their own. They've been so dependent in many cases on the, his, his wife or the woman in the relationship to take on the child rearing and child responsibilities that when men start looking after the child for small periods of time or larger periods of time, that's not familiar. There's a great deal of pressure in society for mothers to assume custody of their children following a breakup of a marriage. There is some degree of stigma attached to mothers who refuse custody of their children, and perhaps refuse is a strong issue. I mean, mothers do have many reasons why they may not choose to parent their children after. They may have other ways of, or might be a, you know, a goal to try to get themselves in a better position so they can assume the responsibility of their children later. So in the future, what might be? Well, predictions that in the future at least half of all marriages will be dissolved. The implication of something like this is, well, how do we best ensure the healthy development of children living in divorced families? Children tend to do best when they have continuity in the relationships and have regular contact with both parents and extended families. Children also need to be assured of adequate financial support. Achieving this demands serious commitment of both parents to the welfare of their children. Also requires effective enforcement of laws as backup. Children's best interests are served if parents receive adequate backup from extended families and society as a whole. And this is this point about sociological imagination, that some of the responsibility, if you will, um, for the success of children is within the two partners who have separated and divorced is that they do the best that they can, but also that society accepts people going through divorce, supports families who have been divorced and not create barriers for them to participate in the rest of societal expectations. If left to do, nothing, if left to do everything alone, the phenomenon of single, a single parent burnout will continue uh, to occur. Okay, there we are. We've looked at part one and part two of the divorce experience. I hope this has worked out well. I hope you're moving along well in this particular um, half of the semester. And we're drawing near the end. All right now, everybody. Good luck and keep on keeping on. Bye now.